Welcome to another session of the NPTEL on nonlinear and adaptive control. I am Srikant Sukumar from Systems and Control IIT Bombay. As always, we are looking at our very nice representative background of a rover on Mars. We hope that the algorithms that we sort of learn how to design in this course will eventually help us drive autonomous systems. Uh, such as the rover on uh, planets such as Mars or the moon and so on. Right. So without delaying any further, let's go into our lectures. Right. So where we uh, were last time is that we had sort of looked at the notion of these normed linear spaces. We had already defined uh, different kinds of norms and um, we have also defined the structure which is a non-linear space and the idea uh, that we sort of pursued last time was to prove that some of the norms that we have defined are in fact valid norms yeah what are the conditions the conditions for a function from the vector space to reals uh, to be a valid norm is that it is non-negative it's zero only when the vector itself is zero satisfies the scalar multiplication property and the triangle inequality all right so as we saw um, usually the first three properties are not significantly hard to show um, and the triangle inequality property is what um, is a little bit more critical and difficult to in fact prove all right let's go back so uh, we did prove all the conditions for the infinity norm the way we had defined it right so the infinity norm was in fact proven to be a valid norm on rn so we wanted to mimic the same for the two norm we in fact started it we proved the first three properties which is that the two norm is non-negative the fact that the two norm is zero only if the vector itself is zero and the scalar multiplication property so we were actually uh, uh, sort of there was a minor error uh, there was a slight error in how we were trying to prove the triangle inequality and so that is what we want to first complete today right? we want to actually complete uh, the proof that the two norm as defined that is the euclidean distance norm as we said satisfies the triangle inequality property of norms right so let's look at this so we started with the two norm of x plus y squared and this is nothing but the summation from one to n absolute value of xi plus yi squared so if i expand this i get something like this that is summation from over i equal to one to n i get xi squared plus yi squared plus twice xi yi now notice that even before i go from here to here this is actually a because i have squared it Right. So, this is the same as taking the square of the quantity xi plus yi itself without the absolute value. Right. So, I can actually get rid of this absolute value here and that is what I do. All right. So, this is still all equalities. All right. So, the xi plus yi absolute value square is sort of irrelevant here because I already took a square. Right. So, this is also irrelevant. So, I get rid of this in this expression. Okay. And now it should be obvious that I can also plug back in the absolute values and this quantity is just the square of the two norm of x. And again, uh, if I look at, I'm sorry, uh, if I look at this quantity, that's the square of the two norm of y. Okay. And I'm left with two summation i equal to 1 to n x i y i okay so now this time we don't do what we were trying to do last time uh, we will do it in a rather simple way from the knowledge of scalar dot products that all of you would know uh, 
holds true in the Euclidean space, right? So I know that this expression right here is nothing but x dot product with y. Okay, so this is just the scalar dot product of x and y. And what do we know about the scalar dot product? We know a couple of things. One is that the scalar dot product, well, it acts like a projection of one vector on the other. If I divide by the unit vector, okay, the other thing that we know is that it is a scalar value. Yeah, that's why it's called the scalar dot product. So when I take a dot product of two vectors, it's a scalar value. And that should be obvious. Right? This scalar, yeah, is also a scalar value. Right? So this is in fact a scalar quantity. Right? And we also know that the scalar dot product is evaluated as this formula. Norm of x times norm of y times cosine theta. What is theta? So, theta is simply the angle between the vectors x and y. Okay. So, whatever is the angle between these two vectors, theta is that angle. And so, you have x dot y is simply norm x times norm y times cosine theta. Now, what do I know about the cosine? We know that the cosine lies between minus 1 and 1 for any value of theta right therefore the cos cosine theta is always less than or equal to 1 right so using that exploiting the fact that cosine theta is always less than or equal to 1 i can immediately create this inequality that is this is less than or equal to norm x times norm y so we have very very effortlessly proved that summation xi yi is less than or equal to norm x times norm y all right and this is exactly what we wanted right because i will plug it back in here in place of this so it was if you notice it was all equalities until this point but then it becomes an inequality because of this guy right and what do i have here this remains the same this remains the same but here i replace two norm x times norm y Okay, and it's easy to see that this is nothing but norm of x plus norm of y whole squared, right? So now if I, you know, sort of cancel the squares on both sides, I have exactly the triangle inequality that I wanted to prove, all right? So this is essentially complete the proof of triangle inequality for the two norm. Like I said, we are not really trying to, uh, well, going to see, uh, we're not really going to see proofs of, uh, for the one norm, three norm, five norm, for any other p norm, but typically proofs will follow in a similar way. Yeah. So one of the important, very critical things to note is that this piece of the proof that you saw here, I'm actually going to highlight it because it's a rather critical piece of the proof. So this piece of the proof that you see here is in fact a proof of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in Euclidean space. Okay, if you notice, the left hand side is actually uh, how we write the inner product. We will look at this notation a little bit later. X dot y is actually x y, the inner product of x y. Right? So this is actually the inner product. So we have essentially proven that the inner product of two vectors is less than or equal to norm x norm y, which is exactly the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. Okay, so we have proven a particular case of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality right here. Okay. So, please remember this. So, this is an, um, by the way, this Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is in fact a rather uh, key inequality, uh, which is satisfied by all norms. Yeah. So, the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality is in fact satisfied by all norms. So, you can also do a general proof, but for now, we have a pretty good specific proof. We are quite happy with it. All right. Okay. Let's move on. We have now proved that, you know, the norms that we have chosen as vector norms are in fact valid vector norms. Great. Let's look at the next set of ideas Okay, that, that we are sort of very keen on. We already spoke about the notion of convergence yeah, very loosely. 
yeah we kept saying limit of a function or we said if the function converges to a constant the derivative doesn't converge function converges to a constant derivative doesn't converge to zero or if the derivative converges to zero the function doesn't converge to a constant so we used this word convergence a few times already in the lectures uh, preceding right uh, but we've been using it loosely yeah, in general whenever uh, even in the past uh, mathematics uh, courses that you would have attended whenever you would have spoken of convergence it's always always associated with uh, the notion of limits okay so there is of course they are very very closely connected yeah it makes sense that whenever we talk about convergence the notion of limits also shows up yeah it's very natural however let's look at a more formal way of defining convergence so once we have a normed linear space all these notions can be very easily defined without a norm because the entire idea of convergence is for uh, terms to get close to a particular point yeah and there is no way to define closeness uh, without the notion of a norm yeah so it was very important for us to have a norm linear space so suppose i have a sequence this is the notation for a sequence i hope you folks have seen this before if not just look at i mean this is very simple notation so each term is basically indexed by a i right? and i goes from 1 to infinity so a sequence inherently has to be infinite okay there is no such thing as a finite sequence okay as soon as i say sequence infinitely many terms should come to your mind okay all right so the terms are all indexed so if you have terms x1 x2 x3 x4 and so on and so forth right? so sequence in a non linear space is set to converge to a point in this space x yeah if for all positive epsilon there exists a positive integer not just any integer i would say z plus there exists a positive integer right such that xi minus x0 the norm of xi minus x0 is less than this epsilon that was given to us right for all i greater than equal to this integer n okay so let's sort of revisit this yeah, we want to look at this again so things are very clear in our mind right so what am i saying i'm saying that any sequence in this non linear space is set to converge to a point yeah if i'm talking about convergence i have to qualify it with a point to which we are converging otherwise it doesn't make sense okay so i have qualified it with a point x not okay so sequence xi in x in this non linear space is set to converge to this point x0 if for all epsilon so if 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 you give me an epsilon so the user has to give me any epsilon and correspondingly i should be able to find an integer a positive integer n such that all my terms beyond the nth term yeah all my terms beyond the nth term are at least epsilon close okay so this is an illustrative picture right this thing on the left here this is an illustrative picture yeah and this this 1 2 3 is the term number right i'm i'm, I'm basically writing i here so the, uh, i equal to 1 i equal to 2 i equal to 4 3 and so on so you note that as i increases my terms are getting closer and closer to zero x zero okay and this is exactly what is meant by this definition yeah it's not difficult to uh, you know, look at some examples so, so let's let's actually look at some examples right so let's see okay suppose i have xi equal to say you know um one over i yeah so what does this so xi converges to this is the notation zero okay? and you can immediately see how it's connected to limits right why why can i say that it is uh, going close to zero because if i given any epsilon positive 
right and i look at x i minus 0 so in this case my x 0 is 0 right so if i look at x i minus 0 right and i want this less than epsilon right that is what is the requirement right i want to find an n such that beyond the nth term everything every term is Le, uh, epsilon away from the equilibrium or epsilon away from the point of convergence x0 okay so i want i want to be epsilon away okay so what should i choose my i it's very easy sorry what should i choose my i as so it's very easy right i mean it's all i have to do is that i should be greater than uh, ceiling function of 1 over epsilon Okay, what is the ceiling function? It's basically a function which uh, uh, gives me the closest integer bigger than a number. Okay, so if I give you 0.7, ceiling is 1. Okay, if I give you 0.5, it is still 1. So, so let's not worry about the halves. But the ceiling function essentially gives you the la uh, closest integer larger than the number. Okay, so if I give you uh, 5.9, 6 5.2 6 okay so the closest integer larger than the number okay so if i take i larger than ceiling of 1 over epsilon okay then what do i know i know xi is less than epsilon yeah all right so i'm done okay as simple as that you take an example xi is let me repeat x i is 1 over i yeah i know just by my limit ideas that this is going to go to 0 so the the uh, point of convergence x 0 is in fact 0 in this case so how do i prove it or how do i find the corresponding n because in order to prove that any series sequence converges i need to yeah, actually be able to give an n so suppose i start with any epsilon epsilon is arbitrary notice that epsilon is very much arbitrary yeah and I want to satisfy this sort of inequality for i greater than or equal to n. Okay. So, what is it? So, this guy here. I choose as my n. Okay. This guy here I choose as my n. Just using the seeding function. Basically, I know that I want to have 1 by epsilon. Anything larger than 1 by epsilon but 1 by epsilon may not be an integer so i just choose the integer larger than 1 by epsilon so i take the ceiling function all right so if i choose this kind of an any i greater than or equal to this n right then i know that x i is less than epsilon and i'm done right because this and this are the same right because all terms are positive in this case so the absolute value is really not much uh, the absolute value function does not play any role okay great so this is how you sort of look at convergence yeah. of course this is a very simple example uh, little more to do when the example is slightly more complicated but not significantly more to be honest yeah okay what is a cauchy sequence right so we we've seen convergence so cauchy sequence is a slightly different notion it says that if i have a sequence xi again in a non-linear space then it is said to be Cauchy if successive terms start getting closer. That is essentially what is quantified or, or qualified by these epsilons and n's. Okay, so the successive terms get closer. Um, what does it mean? That if I'm given any epsilon positive, again I can find an n. Notice all in, in both these cases the n depends on epsilon, right? I mean you can see n depends on epsilon. Right? So a sequence is said to be Cauchy if for all positive epsilon there exists a positive integer let me again do this yeah there exists a positive integer such that successive points are epsilon distance away for ij greater than or equal to n okay so as you go as your terms become you know as your um, i becomes larger and larger yeah successive terms are close Okay, that's essentially what this is. So you can see this picture. You can see this picture. In fact, the series that we just proposed, xi equal to 1 by i, 
right? Is also a Cauchy sequence. It is also a Cauchy sequence. I'm not going to prove this. You can actually think about. Uh, so I will actually say this: find n given epsilon. Yeah. Please treat this as an exercise and do this. Yeah. So if I'm giving an epsilon, try to find the n corresponding to this. Okay. So you want the successive terms to be small. Yeah. So the n will turn out to be slightly different looking than what you have here. But the fact is, this is also a Cauchy sequence. Okay. So uh, an important thing to remember is that, uh, let's see, I'm going to write this in red note. Convergence implies Cauchy, but Cauchy does not imply convergence. All right. So if sequence is convergent, which is why the example I gave you works. I know. Yeah. Because the sequence is convergent, I know that it is Cauchy. Yeah. In fact, from this definition, from, right from this definition, you can prove that it's a Cauchy sequence. I'm not actually showing that proof, but you can do that. Yeah. But for the specific case, I encourage you to find n given an epsilon to prove that this sequence is in fact a Cauchy sequence. The other way around is not true. If a sequence is Cauchy, it is not necessarily convergent. So I can always construct funny example and I have constructed one such funny example for you folks here. Yeah. So I, my norm linear space is the open set zero one. What is the open set zero one? I really hope you know what is an open set. Yeah. Open set zero one is everything inside the zero one except for the end points. Yeah. The end point that is zero and one are not part of the set X. Okay. So I have essentially constructed this, uh, well, if you may ridiculous set to prove my point that Cauchy does not imply convergence. Okay. So, uh, so if I take my uh, sequence as 1 minus 1 by n, what happens as n goes to infinity? One might ask, right? You can see very easily that as n goes to infinity, your xn actually goes to 1. Yeah, so this is where you converge to. But the thing is that one is not part of x all right so this might seem a funny weird trivial sort of example but it's not so trivial yeah you the series seems to be tending to a point but the point is not part of the set okay and if you notice the definition of convergence it should be you should this should remind you of the uh, fine points in any definition the point where you converge has to be part of uh, the set x okay this is rather critical i mean i have constructed sort of a fake example if you may but there are there can be many more realistic examples where the cauchy sequence will not converge yeah okay uh, one good thing is most of the spaces that we concern ourselves with yeah they are uh, in these spaces cauchy sequences in fact converge Okay, and such spaces are called Banach spaces or complete normed linear spaces. Okay, so most spaces we consider like the Rn, 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 Rm, Rp, whatever, they're all Banach spaces. Yeah, that is all Cauchy sequences converge to some point in the space. Yeah, this is rather useful. Okay, I mean, a set, uh, a sort of uh, norm space does, does not have this property uh, can be a very troublesome space because we are always interested in doing convergence analysis and seeing where different signals converge to. Now, if if you don't have a complete space property and your uh, sequence or your signal seems to be tending to a point, but then the point is not part of the set, then I mean, tending to a point which is not part of the set, then you will land in some trouble as far as i mean convergence analysis goes yeah because uh, you have defined a if you have defined a norm only on this set 
x right outside the set x you don't know if the norm is satisfied you don't know if the norm works if the norm exists okay so again don't go just by this example this is a sort of constructed cooped up example but there can be more realistic and funny scenarios where you don't have completeness yeah but also as an aside i must clarify that everything we consider in this course are going to be complete nonlinear space which is essentially also called banach spaces yeah so like we said examples are rn with the infinity norm or the two norm or any in fact any norm yeah these are all banach spaces okay so um, so you seen quite a few notions we quite a little bit of structure once we have the structure of a norm on a vector space we see that we can talk about convergence right so um, which is rather nice we can talk of cauchy sequences completeness and so on uh, another structure which is a little bit more general uh, than a norm is the inner product okay so uh, again we just saw it in the previous slide i used this notation where we said that we talked about the dot product okay so dot product is the sort of the simplest inner product that we all know okay in rn uh, the dot product is the standard inner product yeah and then it's also denoted like this so that's what um is an inner product space an inner product space is again an, a linear space yeah we call it a special non linear space but it's actually any linear space right with a inner product operation okay what is it it's a function which takes two elements of the vector space and maps to the field okay by field i mean where do each component of the vectors belong right for example when i have two vectors in rn every component is a real number so the field is the field of reals okay vectors in the field of reals and then you have a few properties of these inner products okay so what are these just like we had properties for the norm function similarly for the inner product function also we have certain properties okay and what are these properties the first is that it is symmetric yeah. again we are talking about as uh, spaces in the reals okay so otherwise there will be some conjugates and so on and so forth okay so the first property is that the inner product is symmetric yeah. so inner product of x with y is the same as inner product of y with x so sequence is doesn't matter then it has the distributivity property so x comma y plus z inner product is the same as inner product of xy plus inner product of xz okay the third is the uh, scalar multiplication property the alpha the scalar multiplier just comes out of the inner product okay and the final property is that the inner product of x with respect to itself is non negative and zero if and only if x equal to 0 okay so this last statement that you see should already start to remind you of norm right? because this is one of the norm properties yeah here you took one element x and you said that this function is now non negative and zero only when the vector itself is zero okay so this is also a property of the norms if you notice all right so what's an example i already said i mean the mystery is gone right so um, i already said the scalar dot product on rn is a valid inner product right in the field of reals yeah so uh, and and like i also said also hinted in fact right the x with this inner product is also a normed linear space right as soon as you give you an inner product space you can always construct a normed linear space by defining the norm as inner product of x with itself all right so given an inner product space you always have a normed linear space okay so i will stop here so in summary what we looked at today um uh, is the sort of we completed the proof of uh, the fact that the two norm the way we defined is a valid norm then once we have the structure of um, norm linear space we were able to talk about convergence and we did then we looked at what is a cauchy sequence and how the two are not exactly equivalent always and then 
if they're equivalent the fact that there's a Banach space. And then we defined an additional structure or a new structure, which is the notion of the inner products. Okay. And we also saw that uh, the standard dot product that we have been talking about is in fact the inner product. Right? And uh, this inner product space naturally leads to a non-linear space also. Yeah, just by virtue of this construction. Right. So yeah, all right. So that is where we will stop today. Thank you.